So the paper I'm going to present today is titled Tracking Consumers, the trade-off between granola, the value of granola data and uh, consumers' privacy. So this paper is very much at the intersection of marketing, economics, and regulation and policy. Okay, so I'm going to touch on many different topics uh, during the talk. My co-author, Natin Orang, is an assistant professor of marketing at UIGC, and she is a May scholar. Uh, she got her PhD in marketing here a couple of years ago, so she's an idiot. Um, so what we're going to talk about today has to do with the reality of both online presence and mobile presence. So all of you at this point, all of us have smartphones. We use the smartphones. The entire day, uh, we shop on the smartphones. We use our computers. We shop on computers. We just use web browsers, and we carry our smartphones everywhere. And that is generating an entire space of interaction between consumers, between fir with firms, with regulators, and with government agencies. And this is uh, both a source of opportunities, but also a source of potential concerns. So let me start with some, uh, let's see, for some reason it's not working, so I'm going to start with this one. Oh, there you go. So let me start with some facts. So I'm going to try to establish some facts to give you how things uh, look like in real life, and then we're going to jump into what the paper does. So nowadays, most mobile apps can collect very granular information about their users, okay? This has to do with their behavior within the app, but also things such as where consumers are. Just to give you some numbers, in 2018, the New York Times said that 70% of brands would use and share GPS data collected through their app. So it didn't really matter if your app was collecting this data, you could use information that was collected by a different app and that was aggregated through data aggregators. At the same time, and this is related to the paper I'm talking about, Drivers in the United States, but also elsewhere, are going to be on the road an enormous amount of time. And during this time, they're going to be interacting with their phones. They're going to be listening to a podcast. You have a navigation app. They're going to be calling maybe if you're a passenger or a not well-behaved driver. You're going to be texting or something. You're going to be using your phone in all this time that you're on the road. And firms will spend an enormous amount of money on mobile location and targeting. So, there's no doubt that all this information that's being generated through smartphones is of value to firms. We may say, well, but what exactly do they do with this? Well, there's no doubt that firms are trying to use this data to generate new business opportunities. So that part shouldn't surprise us. The question is, what do consumers get out of this? Whether there's something that they're going to get out of this or not, and whether we should be concerned. There's a literature showing that firms actually invest a lot in data analytics and real time tracking. So, again, reveal preferences are going to tell us that they care about this data, they try to collect it, they try to use it, they're going to try to generate business opportunities from that. But these facts and that the data that you can collect is very, very granular is going to lead to privacy concerns. So, we're going to have regulators, we're going to have legislators asking the question of, well, should apps, brands, and stores in general be able to collect this very granular data. And if you look at what has happened in Congress in the last two or three years, there have been several bills proposed that argue that we should limit the extent to which consumers can be tracked. And we have seen platforms already starting to uh, limit the tracking capability of the apps that are on. So just to give you two examples, New York Times and Wall Street Journal this one is the battle for digital privacy is reshaping the internet, and this one is Google allegedly deceive users about location tracking. So these are things that you're going to see in the newspaper, uh, not every week, but often. So what are we going to do? This paper is all about trying to learn what is the value of tracking data. Okay. This is not going to be a paper about is this method of using the data better than the other method. No, we're going to take a step back and we're going to say, hey, there's this enormous amount of data that's being generated. Does it have value first? And the way we're going to frame this is that we're going to look at data that is collected from 
your driving patterns. And we're, the question we're going to ask is whether or not we can predict future retail business. Now, why this one? Like, there are like a million questions that you can try to answer. Why this one? First, there's a lot of data that retailers already have about you. You sign up uh, for a loyalty program when you were at Kroger or at HEB. All they know what you buy, how often you buy, how often you visit, how often do you buy different items. So a lot of that data already exists. Do you have an app from a fast food restaurant? Do you order through the app? They have that information as well. Uh, airline loyalty programs? Well, they know a lot about it. Okay, so the question of what can we learn about consumers behavior that has been on the table for for a long time the, the new question is well if we care about their, their behavior the purchase behavior what can we say if we add this driving information why restaurants well because for restaurants knowing when consumers are going to come can actually be crucial because you can basically think of your labor shift or all the logistics around the restaurant you can time them in such a way that you say, well, I know that there's a higher likelihood of consumers visiting me this week rather than the other one. And you can program your skills better. Once we address this question, we say, well, maybe there is a value, and this value is going to be for firms. And we say, well, firms are going to benefit, for example, from having access to the driving behavior data. We're going to ask whether or not there is a trade-off with privacy. And how are we going to do that? We're going to say, what happens if you were to record data half as frequently as we see in the status quo, or one third as frequently? So we're going to throw out a lot of our data, and we're going to try to go back to the first question and say, well, does this data still have value for this prediction exercise? And the last part of this main part of the paper, we're going to ask whether this value varies depending on whether you are a chain restaurant like a McDonald's or an independent restaurant. And the reason to do that is that it is very often the case that when a new regulation is put in place, that regulation applies to all the members in the industry, but it doesn't differentiate. That means that a blanket type of regulation is likely to have heterogeneous impacts across different types of agents. So even though the rules are the same for everybody, the impact of the rules are going to be different depending on whether you're a big firm or small firm, that in this case would be chain and non-chain restaurants. So what do we find in this part? The first thing that we're going to show you, that I'm going to show you today, what we show you in the paper, is that if we start from a setting, a very traditional marketing setting, where we only use demographic information, and then we add to that information about your past behavior that is what a supermarket could easily do and then we add to that information on your driving patterns the prediction accuracy of all the work to use machine learning and deep learning models is going to increase significantly and that's just in the way we're going to be using data you're going to see we're not doing anything that's super sophisticated at this point in one part of the paper we do but in the rest is pretty standard that is just to show that in this data that is collected normally, like car insurance companies do this all the time, they are, good, they are able to follow your car and to see your driving uh, behavior on the road. That data is going to inform us about your likelihood of going to a restaurant in the future. Then we're going to show that if we start throwing out data because of these privacy concerns and we give more and more uh, importance to consumers' privacy, it is true that getting rid of some of this data like half of the data or two-thirds of the data is going to reduce the accuracy of our models but not by much we're still going to do much much better than if we just use uh behavioral data or demographic information so these models are incredibly powerful in how they and there are good reasons why those in time we're going to get into that once we get to the data and the wall but it is still uh quite interesting to be very honest, this is not something I was expecting. Okay, I was expecting that once you throw out two thirds of the data, we were not going to be able to do anything like that. And this was a surprise to me. And non surprisingly, we're going to see that, the, that having more granular data is going to be more beneficial for uh, independent restaurants, smaller restaurants, non chain type restaurants. Okay, so there's a, there's a 
different branches of the literature, these papers is set touches on marketing, on economics, on regulation, and uh, a little bit of policy. So the bunch of literature going on here, what I have here is mostly economics and marketing. For example, there's a literature on the value of aggregate data investments by construction. That is looking at aggregate data. We're going to be looking at individual level data. There's one exception here, Netzer et al. What they do is to use spectral analysis uh, on loan applications. And they show that looking at this individual level uh, text analysis allows them to better predict uh, the probability of default, uh, better predict default. There's a marketing, an extensive marketing literature on location tracking and how it improves targeting. Some of these, for example, what they do is that when consumers go into a shopping mall, they track consumers as they move with hotspots along the, the shopping mall and they receive text messages and with coupons and they see whether people redeem the coupons or not. Instead of doing that, we're just going to be looking at consumer driving trajectories and with our concerns with privacy. And finally, there's an growing literature on the impact of privacy regulations on firms and consumers. Okay, the difference with this literature is that we're going to be looking at what happens if we record the data less often. Rather than aggregating the data, we're going to say what happens if we aggregate, if we uh, record the data. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, what I'm going to do is um, to focus on three main topics. I'm going to spend most of my time in the first part, I'm going to be talking about the data. I'm going to give you examples of how the data looks like, where the data comes from. And I'm going to talk a lot about it. And I'm going to spend a lot of my time explaining what is the research design that we're going to use. Then I'm going to jump into the results. And the results are going to be divided basically into three parts, like the main set of results, some counterfactuals, that is when we drop some of the data. And we're going to explain how we do that and how we measure uh, what comes out uh, of our analysis and then we're going to look at heterogeneity and the final part of the paper is the part where we actually look at what is the value of this to consumers because up to this point we're saying well let's see if this data has value to firms and let's see if we drop data if it still has value to firms and if we drop more data does it still have value to firms but in the last part of the paper, we can say, okay, it does have value to firms. Let's see if it has value to consumers. And why do we want to do that? Because if it has value to consumers and to firms, then legislators have a problem. Because they have to basically say, if we restrict how much data is going to be collected, not only we are hurting firms, potentially, but we're also hurting consumers. And that's going to introduce a problem to regulators. Instead, if you say, no, you know what? This is not, consumers don't, there's no value to consumers whatsoever. They will say, well, I'm just going to restrict what firms can do, but I'm going to protect consumers. But we're going to see that there's a trade off here that is important because both of them are going to benefit from the type of trade opportunities that are going to show up here. Okay, so what is, what, what is the approach we're going to follow here? So, what we did uh, for this paper is that we partnered with an app. Okay, this is a local app. You're going to say it in a minute, maybe you know it. And we're going to use proprietary data from the app for, uh, for 2018 and 19. So all of this is pre-COVID, okay? We're not using post-COVID data. We're thinking about developing new work with them and new experiments and things like that, but for now, we're just using pre-COVID data. The app has, or had at the time, around 200,000 users. And for this application, we're going to use a 15% sample of users. Why that? Not, it's not a random sample at all. It's actually we had to restrict who could go into analysis because we wanted people that were driving. Okay? We didn't want people that would download the app, use it for a couple of days, and then get rid of it. We needed people that would drive, that would drive often, that would use the car normally. And with those restrictions that are described in the paper, we ended up with this number of users that is more or less 50% of the total number of users. We're going to have individual data. That means that we are going to follow phones. Okay, if you have two phones, we don't know. Okay, those are two different IDs. For me, those would be two different people. Okay, we don't follow people, we follow uh, phones. There's going to be demographic information. 
such as age and gender. This is exactly the same as you would get when you open an account with Crotty. Okay, this is information that you provide to the retailer, and that happens. Uh, that, that's information that every retailer has. And if even if you open an account with a retailer and you don't give them the, their gender, they can use off-the-shelf algorithms to try to infer gender from names. So most retailers are going to have that information. In our data, the average user is 32 years old and 44% are female. And together with that, from the data, we're going to get something of the order of 450 million GPS data points that we have to handle somehow. Um, and what we see is that during this time period, people drove on average 406 miles. They made 239 stops. I can talk later about how we measure and identify those stops, and they make something around 96. There's a lot of variation here. So some people go to restaurants a lot, some people go very little. What we're going to do with this data is that we're going to combine it with three other data sources. The first one is going to be data from Safecraft. Safecraft is a company that basically does what they do is to find how many phones go to a particular point of interest, a particular business in a particular in a week. Okay. They became a very big thing during COVID because they made a lot of their data available to researchers trying to identify, for instance, how people move uh, out of their counties when there were set of home borders and things of that type, and how people would share with others uh, during all that time period. Okay. And, what we could learn from people by looking at their phones. They aggregate the data, they don't release the information on the phone level. Though. In this paper, however, we're not going to use any of the data. What we're going to use is data that Safer gave us to identify all restaurants in Texas. So actually what we're going to see is the geometry of the polygon that identifies a store. So for instance, on University Avenue, you have all these restaurants. We're going to see each of their polygons on a map. And we're going to be able to overlay that with uh, the GPS data from your phones. And we're going to be able to say, well, you went to a particular restaurant or not. Okay, so that's that's what we're going to do with the safer data. Then we're going to combine that with Yelp. But Yelp is going to give us these restaurant ratings, price levels, and categories. We're going to do this because we want to do some heterogeneity analysis to see uh, which restaurants were uh, would benefit the most for having data that is uh, more more disaggregated. And finally, we're going to use data from Price List to this these two are online data. Uh, what these are websites. We're going to be able to get uh, menu prices. So with that, we're going to have an idea of what's going to, a measure of revenues, like an additional visit to a restaurant. What does it mean? Okay, so that's those are the sources of information where they. Fernando, yes. Do you handle people this data? No, we partner with them. So with the with the driving app, we partner with them. With SafeGraph, they gave us the data. So we reach out to them and they were happy to help. These two, we web spread <laughs> all this data. Okay, so this is the app that we're going to be using. So this is an app that was developed in town. This app has a uh, the reason to be is that they want to reward safe driving. Okay, so the idea is you download the app, you create an account, and when you drive around and you're a good driver, meaning that you don't use your phone, and let, you can use it for navigation, and you can use it, for instance, if you have a podcast on the background or something like that, but if you don't, if you're not texting, checking your email and stuff like that, they give you points. And you accumulate points, and at some point you can go and visit some of the parts of participate in restaurants or gyms or other stores and redeem your points. So this is a platform. Okay, this is a platform that is serving two sides of the market. It's serve, serving drivers who want to be rewarded for the safe driving behavior. And they have businesses that are basically advertising on the app. And these businesses are going to give you coupons. They're going to say, come here for 450 points. If you buy a coffee, you get a muffin. Okay, so generally they're not going to give you something for points. You are going to basically buy something and get something. So that, so that's a, that's the ideal part. So basically, the restaurant is getting something because it's generating a visit that otherwise wouldn't happen. 
and the consumer is getting something because, well, I can go and I just pay for the coffee, but I can get a muffin with my points. So both sides of the market benefit, and that's crucial. I'm going to show you later that some, one of the ways in which the app does this is that when you are not driving, they're going to send you push notifications. And they're going to say, well, visit this particular restaurant. And in that way, you, if you react to that, the, that, that's a business opportunity, a trade opportunity that wouldn't have happened if the app didn't exist. So that's already hinting at where the benefit to consumers is going. So this is how the data looks like. So here we have data for some days. This is not all the data. These are two different consumers. And what we have here, all these little points that you see are points that the app recorded. The big black dots, these are points that we identify as stops. We identify a stop, we call something a stop if it lasts, if the time between two points is more than 10 minutes but less than two hours. Okay? Because we want to get rid of conflicting points, like we don't want to know where you live or where you were or anything else. So we want to get out of all those concepts. So those are the, red, the, the black dots. And then the red dots are restaurants where you stop. So in this particular case, this user stopped at a ticket and an outback. And obviously, I hope those were not in the same day because you know you ate a lot. And this other guy stopped at Taco Bell and Brooklyn Cafe. Okay. So this is so that last point, the red dots are coming from overlay safe graph with the GPS data for stops. So that's how it looks like. With this, well, we have 30,000 users, we have 14 months of data. So these are just two pictures out of all of that. Okay, so what are we going to do? So we're going to be in the framework of machine learning and deep learning. Okay, that's what we are going to be looking at. So why that framework? Because the exercise we want to do is to predict a retail visit and see how that prediction changes when we change the, we change the information that we give to our model. So to do that, we're going to divide our data on two dimensions. First of all, we're going to divide our users, the 31,530 users, into a training data set. That's going to be 80% of our sample, and that's going to be random, obviously, and a test set that's going to be the remaining 20. So what we're going to do is train a number of balls. Like I, I want to say something like seven or eight or something. We're not. We're, we're basically taking balls, training them, getting them to the best shape using consolidation, and then just we present all of them in the paper. But I'm going to focus the presentation on only one of them. And we're going to train our model using the training users. But very, very importantly, we're going to do that over one time period, the first year of our data. And then we're going to make predictions for the other set of users in the last two months of our data. So this is going to be very important because the model, once trained, is going to make predictions for users that it has never seen in a time period that it has never seen. And that's going to be important both because, I don't know, let's say this is summer and we're looking at whether or not you buy ice cream, well, there's going to be a seasonal component. So we need to have a break both on the users uh, dimension but also in the temporal dimension so we, that's why this is going to look like what are we going to do first we are going to generate a number of features that we're going to feed into our models the first set of features as i said is something that every retailer has demographic information age and gender then during the training period for both the training users and the test users we're going to create behavioral features. What are those? Let's say we're talking about a pizza restaurant. We're going to look at how many times during this time period you went to that pizza restaurant, how many times you went to pizza restaurants more in general, like the same category, for example. And we are also going to generate information from the tracking data. What are we going to do with the tracking data? In the first part of the paper, where we only use machine learning uh, tools, we're going to generate summary statistics of driving. What do I mean by that? We're going to look at radius of duration. We're going to look at entropy. We're look, going to look at the number of stops that you make when you drive, the number of uh, stops of a certain length. See, all of those, in the end of summary statistics, we're not using the trajectory data. 
we're only going to use the trajectory data when we get to the end of the paper. Once we have all this information, we're going to, well, we're going to train our models using training users, and we're going to make a prediction out of sample for the test users. And here's the part that's going to get interesting. We do that. Once we do this, we could stop here and say, you know what? This model that incorporates all the pieces of data does better than the model that only has two or the model that only has one. And we could do that, and that would allow us to say what is the value of this third piece of data. Now we're going to go one step further, and we're going to say, well, drop half of your data. Because in this new policy regime, legislators in Congress decided that you could only track consumers, I don't know, every x seconds, or two x seconds, or three x seconds, whatever the fraction is. Okay? If we do that, and we want to see how that impacts our rules, we have to go back and regenerate two thirds of this pie. Why? Because we're going to, the, the app starts collecting data when a new trip starts. So the initial point of a trip, the identifying factor, has to be in your data. And then we're going to say, well, instead of keeping every point as in the status quo, we're going to keep every point, every two X points or every three X points, throwing away half or two thirds of the data. So we have, we're going to miss some visits because those may be points that we're going to draw when we are in, in this new policy region. And that's going to impact our summary statistics of tracking as well because we're dropping a lot of this information. And then we're going to go back and make an out of sample prediction in this new side. So that's how, how this is going to look. Any questions that you may have? Have you tried, uh, for example, suppose you do a split in the training and the testing period, you take the 40 months, you do a uh, cross validation. We are doing cross validation. Uh, you are doing cross validation. Yeah, we're doing 10, tenfold cross validation. Yeah. And using the 40 months? No, in the training period. Okay. Yeah. So I, we are, I haven't tried what you're saying, we're doing, we're doing it here. So, so is the cross validation error kind of agreed with the two months the testing out sample testing error? That's a good question. I have to take that. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, that's a, a very good question. Well, I think the reason I'm asking this question is. Uh, you mentioned about that there's a season dependent activity yeah right so uh, just so happens suppose your algorithm is sensitive to that kind of activity they, they predict the equally well or equally worse on the activities throughout the year yeah. and then the two months is representative yeah. it just so happens that, that two months activity you can predict better than the other month or there's worse than the other month special, and yeah. then you, you don't capture the rest of exactly the no. so if that happens you're going to see the difference yeah the no that's that's a very good point yeah thank you Okay, so let me show you the results. The structure of, the, of this section is first I'm going to show you the baseline results, then I'm going to look at tangent factors, and then I'm going to look at heterogeneity. So what I'm presenting here, okay, let me move that out of the way. Okay, well, the title, you cannot see it, but that's fine. What we're going to do here is in the paper, we actually use moles such as lasso, random forest, x tubes, and we present all the results in the paper. Here, I'm just going to show you the results for lasso. And then at the end of the paper, we use a deep learning tool called transformers that I'm going to present at the very end of the presentation. The results all go in the same direction. The numbers change a little bit, but the results all move in the same direction. So this table presents the results for lasso, and it has four measures of performance that are commonly used when you are evaluating the performance of classifiers or these type of models. And I have three rows that I'm going to cover that each of them represents a different information set. So what are we going to do here? We're going to go and we're going to take one of many models and we are going to evaluate how that model predicts out of sample with a given information set. Now, re please remember, the exercise we're doing is we're predicting whether a consumer is going to go to a restaurant in the next two months, okay? In the last two months of the, our data. That by definition is a yes or a no. 
So if you have no information whatsoever, you say, well, there's a 50 50 chance that you're getting COVID. Okay? Absent any other information. So the baseline here, the random guess is the 50 50. All the numbers here have to be measured against the 50 50. So when we go and we say, well, let's just use demographic information. Well, for a restaurant, the demographic information seems to add something, but not very much, very, actually very, very little, which is not really that surprising, okay? Why, whether you're male or female, or you're 32 or 45, would be informative about the likelihood that you're going to go to a restaurant in the next two months. Now, maybe it would be different if this is a, a different retailer that is very targeted to a particular demographic. Maybe in that case, that would really matter, okay? So what I want to say is the fact that this is a very minor improvement or a non-improvement at all relative to the random guess may be a feature of the setting. Okay, it may not translate to other settings. So if you have a store that is super targeted to a demographic, maybe this first jump would be significantly larger than what we observe. I'm going to talk about the other columns in a second, but I'm going to start with accuracy. That is something that we normally use. Then I'm going to talk about I'm going to start now with the second group of data, the second information set that is going to add information on uh, behavior, on past behaviors. So what does that mean? Have you gone to this restaurant in the past? How many times have you gone to this restaurant? Do you go to restaurants of this category? So if you like Italian food, it's not just this one, it's Italian food in general. How often do you go to this type of uh, location? And we see an increase in the accuracy of, the, of these models it's not enormous. Oh, I don't know. I don't have something in mind. I'm saying in general, this is how much it should improve. But but it is a significant improvement. Everything that is in parentheses here is a, is a standard error. So these are the means over 100 volts of verification. And then we're going to add tracking information. But remember, we're not using the trajectories here. We're using summary statistics of driving behavior. But then we see an enormous increase in the performance of these models. Now. An issue with accuracy is that if you think of the underlying data, our data is you visit or you did. If most of our data is no visits, because I don't know most people don't go to restaurants all the time, so or every day, so it, would, it wouldn't be surprising that a lot of the data is zeros. Then a model in the extreme would say, well, you know what? If we predict only zeros, we're going to do significantly better than trying to predict the few ones that you have in your dates. So that's why we also have the other measures like precision, recall, and the F1. The key thing here, though, is that it doesn't really matter. When you move across the different measures, even measures that are going to be looking at the prediction of visits, uh, than the correct prediction of visits done by the mall, we're going to see significant improvements once we add the driving data. So this is saying, mm -hmm firms that were to use this type of information to predict the likelihood that their consumers are going to visit them in the next month would learn quite a bit from this uh, information. Yes, sir. Well, the accuracy, precision, or the chances of them visiting the restaurant vary based on the city, the size of the city, the traffic, the distance between my house and the restaurant. Uh, have you looked at that? And also, um, have you tracked, whether you have plans to track whether or not I look on Google Maps for a restaurant and then I click on the page, it goes to the restaurant's page, and then the chances are, what are the chances of me actually going to the restaurant? Okay. Have you tracked all that? Two questions. Yeah, so on the second one, no. Okay, the second one, the Google Maps and going, we don't see that. Okay, that's information we don't have. We could, but we haven't done, but we could is uh, add a section on heterogeneity, exploring uh, things such as uh, whether you're in a city versus, like, I don't know, if you're in versus college station and proximity to restaurant and things like that. We could do that, we haven't. Okay. But, but the second one, we can't because we, we are never going to observe. Uh, I may assume that will vary. Um, it does. I'm going to show you in a minute, how it, but I'm going to show you how it varies across restaurants, not how it varies across consumers, because your question is across consumers. Yeah. yeah. So, so. No, no, but it's, it's yeah, absolutely true. So yeah, that's something we can do because we have that information. Okay. But, uh, yes. So uh, can you remind us what is the precision? Oh, yeah, actually I wrote them down, so I didn't forget them. Okay, so one thing that we're going to do, okay. So the problem with this one is that it can lead to you predicting just zeros in accuracy. Because 
because the, what the model wants to do is to minimize a, a loss function. And one way to minimize that loss function when that is defined by accuracy is just by predicting all zeros. Precision is going to take that into account. And what prediction is going to do basically is going to be the fraction of correctly classified visits uh, over true positives and false negatives. So it's just going to focus on uh, trying to minimize, to maximize it once. And then recall is going to be the fraction of correct, correctly classified visits over total visits. So the difference is going to be the denominator. In one case, it's all visits. In the other one, is the predictions of the model. That the model predicts visits that are correctly uh, predicted. Isn't the accuracy one over them? Hmm? Is the accuracy one of them? No. No, 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 no. So the accuracy oh, is uh, so, how many times oh, you predicted the visit divided uh, by by the total number of visits. Yes. And, and you said recall is also that. No, no, sorry. I said uh, correctly predicted visits and non visits over a total number of observations. So this one is looking at the zeros and the ones. Correctly predicted visits and correctly predicted non visits uh, over all observations. Okay. And this one is going to be correctly predicted visits okay. over observations. Yeah. So, so, I, so I got the right because I always mix them. <laughs> so, right, right. I have a question here. It's like when you explain the accuracy, you said that the, you know, understandable the demographic information doesn't really have much to, to indicate how we go to a restaurant, right? So the number is only slightly above 15%, which is random gaps. Yeah. Uh, and but if you look at the precision and recall, and both yeah. of them are actually noticeably higher than yeah. that. And why? Why is this? No, I, I honestly don't have an answer to that question. That's that's one thing that we could do, and I don't remember doing, is for instance start dropping some of the demographics and trying to pin down which of the demographics is leading to those results. Mm -hmm. Because there might be that you say, for instance, a big fraction of our population in town is super young. And if our restaurants are, and they are, uh, fast food and that type of location, maybe age is driving a lot of that. So that, that could be, but I, I don't have a, something I can show you right here. Okay, so the second, uh, oh, well, F1 is just a combination of uh, precision and recall, and it balances, uh, it's a geometric uh, harmonic mean. Uh, so the second part of the paper, oh sorry, I, I forgot one thing that is actually pretty important. So what one thing that is uh, important to keep in mind is that these are all means across all these bootstrap replications, but we want to know whether this how these numbers compare when you are trying to evaluate the usefulness of, of a specific model, and just the mean is not informative about the model's whole. So we have the receiver, receiver operation uh, operating characteristic curve that basically is going to tell us if you want a particular true positive rate, how much do you have to allow in terms of a false positive rate? Obviously, you would always want to increase your true positive uh, rate, minimizing the false uh, positive rate. Okay, so you would like to be in this area. The 45 degree line is a randomness. So th there's no information whatsoever in that. And when we look at the green line, you, you can see that the green line only has demographic information, and it's pretty much on the diagonal. So this is saying, if you want a 50% uh, true positive rate, you basically have to allow for a 50% false positive rate. So that's pretty much useless. Okay, so that, that, that's a way to put it. In this setting, that, that's not an image. Then we say, well, what happens if we add behavior information? And we it's better for a 50% here, you are somewhere below, or it's, it's doing better. But the, Tracking information is what's adding a lot here. So you're saying, even for a 50% true positive rate, I can be around a 10% false negative. So the improvement by just adding uh, the tracking data is significant. It's not just the mean, it's that depending on the kind of mechanism that you think about designing, that's the trade-off uh, that you can actually find. Okay, so let me tell you about the country factor. So I just show you that firms are, or should be, really happy with this data. They can use it to try to predict consumer behavior, future visits. So firms are going to invest in this thing. They're going to get their apps out there. They're going to collect your tracking information. Regulators are going to be concerned. They're going to say, we don't like that, okay? So we're going to say, well, wait, before you go and you decide to prohibit all this data, because we know what happens when you prohibit tracking information, we lose, a, we lose all this gain that comes with this data. Before that happens, let us try to do some form of an exact evaluation and see whether or not we need to ban. Okay. 
So what we're going to do is to say, first, we're going to collect the data half as frequently. That means that if the app records information every lambda seconds after a trip starts, we're going to say we will collect the data every two lambda seconds. Or if it is every lambda minutes, two lambda minutes. Okay, I'm masking what the app really does. You can check the app on the website and then you can see how often they do it. Um, and then we can say what happens if we track the data every three lambda seconds or minutes. And finally, we're going to take in these two, we're actually, well, in all of them, we keep the initial point of a trip and we only, we only impact when the next point is recorded. Okay? And we drop all the other information as if it never existed. And then we're going to say, well, what happens if you start a trip and we know that if you were to keep 50% of the data, this is the number of points that you would keep. What happens if those points are recorded randomly and not with the sequence of the two lambda or three lambda seconds? So what we're trying to figure out is whether there is a value to the sequentiality of the points or whether it's the amount of information, the number of points that you're collecting. Now, because in this part of the paper, we're using summary statistics of driving, you shouldn't expect the sequentiality of the points to be very important. Because we're just saying, well, how much do you drive? And that doesn't really matter if we collect, if we have your third point, your sixth point, and your ninth point, or we have the first, third, and fifth. Okay? That's going to change a little bit in the last part of the paper, but we're not there yet. Uh, the one concern would be what happens if we do the 50% uh, random points, and it happens that we collect all the points at the beginning of a trip, and we don't get the entire length of a trip. And we're going to lose pieces and things like that. So there's potential for these to impact things, but what we find, so this is what we have in the previous table. So this is a 70.31. What we find is that when we drop half of the data or two thirds of the data, sure, the model performs a little bit worse, but I was expecting significantly worse, okay? If you look at what happens when we drop this data entirely, we get to 58%. When we are using one third of the data, we are 66.39. This is more than what I was expecting. That, to be honest, that trial was not informed. This was more of a gut feeling. Uh, but once I started saying this, and even when you get the data from them, you are still able to improve on the prediction of these algorithms significantly relative to when you don't have this data. This is part where you say, well, hey, maybe we don't need to buy these things. Because firms, even with restricted data, they can still do significantly better than what they can do without this data. So maybe there is like this middle point where regulator firms and consumers can agree on something. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it could happen. And you see this is exactly the same across all uh, measures. Okay. Um, okay. So this is not what you were asking for. This is across restaurants. What we're showing here is that here we have needs across restaurants and I'm, re I'm reporting the overall mean prediction accuracy. But when you look at different restaurants, what we have here is the, the accuracy gain when you, you look at complete tracking minus the half tracking. So how much does it give you going from half to full accuracy? And we see that there are some places that gain a lot, some places that are losing. But for example, we have a tick filler here, we have a tick filler there. Why, why is this one losing and this, this one when, I don't know. So here's where I'm thinking that your comment could actually help us because we can say, well, we can start thinking about where are these locations? Where are they relative to the mass of consumers and things of that sort? So that's something we don't have in the paper right now, and we could actually do more on that dimension. Okay, the final thing we do in this part of the paper is to say to look at um, how the gains from having more data um, vary across types of firms. What we have here is a linear regression where the dependent variable is the difference in accuracy between having the full granularity of the data and having half of it. So if the full data gives you 90% accuracy and the half gives you 80%, it's going to be 0.1. It's that those 10% that you want. Now that's going to be the same if the full data gives you 0.4 and the half data gives you 0.3. So that's why we have the fourth column that is also going to control for the baseline accuracy. Key point here, like what is the point of this slide? Is that basically the firms that gain the most from having access to full granularity in our models 
are going to be the non-chain restaurants. The, non the chain restaurants are going to gain less than the non-chain restaurants. So if you say, if we go and we implement a policy that is going to prohibit uh, collecting this type of data, who's going to suffer the most? Non-chain restaurants. That's the key point. That's the point of this slide. Now, you have the yeah. R square value is so low. Oh, but we have like 60, like 70 observations or something like that. And to be honest, in economics, this is not that low. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so the point is that you have one observation per restaurant. So there are many unobservables that are not being included. In, I cannot include like a restaurant pizza fact because I, I would have to drop all my observations here. But, but with the R square value so low, you still, still have like something significant. Yeah. Which basically that means your model only captures about 20% of yeah. the information. That's pretty really good. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah. No, but that, yeah, it's, it's fine. Okay, so the last slide that I want to show you here is a part of the paper that we're still, and maybe you have some feedback on this, is that we're not really sure how much to push it. And this is the reason. Our baseline rule we write in summary. So here, we have, for this I'm going to explain in a second, we're using a slightly smaller sample. So that's why you see a higher accuracy rate, okay, for the basic model. Then we bring in a deep learning model called transformers that's going to allow us to use and to capture other dimensions of this data that the models like Lasso and XGFUS and Random Forest can have. In particular, is the inclusion of the driving trajectory. And very basically, that means instead of using driving summaries, uh, sorry, summary statistics of driving behavior, we can actually incorporate the sequentiality of the points that one point happens after the other. And what you see is a significant improvement across all measures. Now, so this is it. But why? Why do we have to restrain our sample? Because computationally, these models are significantly more costly. So just so here we're looking at the top 10 restaurants and a random sample of a thousand users rather than 30,000 users. And doing that takes like an hour or slightly more than that. And the other models take like seconds or minutes. So the question is, if you think about a restaurant or a platform that is going to provide this type of service to the customers, is this something that is feasible in a, in a basically on an on-demand uh, kind of feature versus something like that. So that is significantly less computational expensive. So we're like trying to figure out whether or not to push this dimension more. We think that these improvements that you see are obviously enormous, but on the other hand, the computational complexity of these uh, may make it less attractive for people that are in industry and trying to buy these models. Okay. Okay, so in the nine minutes that I have left. Um, I'm going to show you the one part that I haven't talked about because I started saying, do firms benefit from using this type of data if they want to predict? I said, yes, they do. And that makes regulators very nervous. So what happens if instead of prohibiting uh, the use of this information, of this data, we go and say, well, you can use it, you can record less often. Well, firms still benefit. So we, I said, well, there's some space there for firms and regulators to agree on something. So the last part of this is going to be about what I'm going to say is consumers. I'm going to try to bring consumers into the equation. And the way I'm going to do it is something that is very natural. Like when you have apps that you use to purchase things, the way you, there are two ways you can interact with the app. One is, I don't know, Black Friday, you have your Amazon app on your phone, you go and you look for stuff and you buy. But you can also get notifications. All of us get push notifications. Say, hey, there's this deal. There is this other thing. And you may react to it. So if you react to a notification, I am going to say you benefit from that. If not, you wouldn't. And you would say, well, I don't want my phone to give me a notification. I say, well, you're reacting to the notification. You're making a purchase out of that uh, notification. So I'm going to say you, your actions, beyond what you say, your actions are showing that you benefited from that notification. So if consumers react to notifications, I would say, well, they're, they're better off than without those notifications. So the, the key thing is, who do we give the notification, or who do we send the notification to? So this is how it would look like. So this is my co-author's phone, I guess. And you would get a push notification that's going to say, well, check out the rewards for a 
particular restaurant. Or you could say, this particular restaurant has a new reward. And you can decide whether or not to click on it. Okay? The question is, who is going to get this uh, notification? In marketing, there is an enormous literature and a growing literature basically using tracking data to better target customers. The obvious reason for this is that you don't want to target people that are not going to react to it because that's costly. And you don't want to target people that are going to purchase anyway because that's wasting money. Okay, so you want to target the people that are like on the fence. That person that you says, you say, this person has like a, I don't know, 40% probability of making a purchase. If I send them a muffin or a coupon, I move that from 40 to 60. And now I have a person that buys a coffee but gets the muffin for free. Okay, that's the consumer that you want to target. You don't want to target the guy that has a 1% probability of buying because that person is not going to react. So what we're going to do here, and think of this as we are going to counterfactually evaluate alternative uh, targeting policies. Um, what we are thinking is in the future, as we continue to work with the app, we're going to be able to actually evaluate with data policies that are implemented. Right now, we're basically saying we're going to simulate a policy. What we're going to do is the following. Assume that there is a certain policy TK that basically K says this is a subset of consumers that are going to be targeted. And obviously, if you define the subset of the classroom that is going to be targeted, I'm defining also the subset that is not. Okay? So when we think about what are the expected profits of a particular targeting policy, we can divide those between the expected profits that come from the consumers that were targeted and the expected profits of the consumers that come from the consumers that were not targeted by the policy. I would assume, because of the type of data we have, that profits have three parts. Revenues, basically how much you spend when you go to a restaurant. Marginal cost, that is the cost of the restaurant for serving you. And the cost of the targeting policy. So I can rewrite that into what are the profits that come from people that were targeted and decided to visit. That's the probability that they visit condition on them, them being targeted. Then I have the cost of targeting people that were targeted but decided not to visit. So these are the people that got the message and said, nah, no, I'm not going. And then I have the people that were not targeted but decided to visit. These are your loyal consumers. There are a couple of assumptions we have to impose. For example, that you are going to spend the same regardless in which group you are. That's because we don't have purchase data. We don't see people going and paying. Okay, so I cannot, I don't know if you spend similar or not, depending on whether you were targeted. So we're going to make some assumptions during the paper. But basically, just from this equation, we are going to be able to compare what is the uh, what is the difference in the expected profits from a particular policy relative to what the app already uses. And with that, we're going to be able to say which policy is actually better uh, in expectation. One thing that is going to be super important is that the policy that the app currently uses only considers proximity to a restaurant. So what does that mean? If you drive in the neighborhood of a particular restaurant, then when you're not driving, you may get a push notification. Not when you're driving, because they, don't want, to, they, they want to reward good behavior, not bad driving behavior. So they're going to basically, based on distance, they're going to send you this push notification. They have other things that, for example, if you receive one last week, you may not receive one this week and stuff like that, but it's basically a measure of distance, okay? We're going to do something different. We're going to say, when we're looking at these probabilities and we're going to decompose these probabilities using the log total probability, we are going to go and use our models, the lasso, random forest, XG pools, all of these. One of the outcomes of those models is what is the probability that a consumer will visit? That's the outcome. The outcome is not whether or not you visit or not. It's a probability. So what we're going to say is, let's use those probabilities and let's look at consumers. This plot goes all the way to 40%. I'm going to say, well, if you have a consumer that has a 5% probability of visit, according to my last of all, of like six slides before, this consumer is a consumer that is very unlikely to visit. Okay? So I wouldn't give him or send him a push notification. A consumer that has a 30%, eh, that person is more on the margin. So if that person gets a push notification, maybe that person is going to respond. What we have here on the, y, on the vertical axis is the ratio between the expected profits associated with my targeting policy that 
depends on what is your unconditional probability visit and the expected profits according to the default targeting policy that uses only distance. And what we show is that basically, if you're targeting, because you didn't know this before, but if you're targeting consumers that have a very low unconditional probability visit, those guys are not going to go. And my policy would say, well, don't target those, target the guys that are on the margin. Okay? Now, if you look at these, you can say, well, that's obvious. Okay? If you target the person that has a 1% chance of going, you're never going to get that person to go. And say, yeah, but you didn't know that that person had a 1% chance of going. Okay, it's the models that I just showed you that bring in the driving data that tells you that that guy has a 1% probability. Okay. Did you actually do the experiment? No. So what we're doing is basically in conversation with the app to do this. So what we do here is basically we use the historical data to say, well, to compute these two yeah. using the, the predictive probability. You could be surprised. You know, uh, it Five percent guy actually go. It could be absolutely. So it, it, in the end, it would be a it would be a problem of sample size. <laughs> Hopefully, that guy doesn't dominate the sample. <laughs> right, because yeah. I think I think the thing is the human reaction to certain kind of things are very complicated, right? No, that, absolutely. So yeah, so all of this is saying, well, if I take the data as it as it was, and I on that I impose the, I use the models that I have. Tried. But that's okay. So just to wrap up, because I have like one minute. Um, so in this paper, what we do is basically to bring to the table this new source of information. That is all this data that is collected as you drive uh, in your day-to-day -day life. And what we do is to say, well, this data that has been rarely used, well, farms have it, but they, they don't really use it that much. And by researchers, uh, it's going to allow us to learn a lot about consumers' uh, visit behavior, retail visit behavior. And what we show is actually it does, and it, it both benefit firms. It has this trade off that you say, well, it invades potentially invades privacy, but we can reduce data collection and still have the gains associated with, uh, with this information. So there is space for both firms, regulators, and consumers to come together and to agree on a setting which you say, you know what? Tracking in itself is not bad because if consumers react to these push notifications, then they, they're, they're showing that they, they agree with it and that they benefit from it. Okay, so that's what we're doing. The paper is going to have implications for managers, researchers, and regulators, but we think that there's space here to basically say this is not a setting where you want uh, a common regulation that says, you know what, we get rid of all tracking. We think that there's uh, benefits to all the people that are involved in this, uh, at least from having this tracking data on the table. Okay, so that's all I have. So thank you very much. If you have any comments or questions, those are our emails. Okay.